Hey there, folks. Welcome to another edition of Stranger in a Southern Land. I, of course, am your host, Jake Manning. Uh, thank you for coming coming back or tuning in for the first time. I don't know where you are as far as your listening habits right now, but uh, I've got one heck of an interview for you guys today. Uh, I sit down with Jillian from the Charlotte Hounds, and we get to talk about uh, how Charlotte became a host city of a major league lacrosse team. And, you know, Jillian was just full of answers because I was full of questions. And we detailed the whole process from basically beginning to end. And uh, I must say, this is probably one of the better interviews I've done at this moment in time. So uh, I really do appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, this is definitely one of those ones you want to check out if you want to figure out what I'm doing over here at Stranger in a Southern Land. But if you want to figure out what I'm doing wrestling-wise this weekend, I will be at WrestleCon, along with probably tens upon thousands of wrestling fans. Uh, WrestleCon will be a three-day event, so uh, please check them out. It's a major convention with a major show. I'll be doing a little bit of wrestling with some friends, uh, but all kinds of stuff. Freight Train's going to make the long trip out there. Uh, he'll have his DVD, he'll have T-shirts, he'll have pictures, he'll have autographs. All kinds of things will be available. And not just Freight Train, but people like Rob Van Dam, Matt Hardy, Ric Flair, and just everybody. Everybody under the sun is going to be there when it comes to wrestling. So make sure you check out WrestleCon at WrestleCon.com. But anyways, if you want to know more kind of what I'm going on and what I'm doing, especially that weekend, I'll probably make a few Twitter posts. Make sure you follow me at Manscout Manning on Twitter. Or if you have any questions about the show, make sure you email me, uh, jake at SSL show.com. Or if you have any booking inquiries, feel free to email me at Manning at yahoo.com. So anyways, enough of the plugs, enough of where I'm going to be. I always try to keep this part pretty short because I... I hate it if I was doing all this work and uh, make sure I say my words correctly and you're just going to fast forward to the interview. But anyways, no need to fast forward to the interview because we're going to jump into it right now. I'm going to sit down and talk with Jillian from the Charlotte Hounds here on Stranger in the Southern Land. problem is my headphones are really loud but i'll deal with it <laughs> been to a few rock concerts so I'd all right gotcha. yeah, yeah, i got some blown my out dad either. has the same problem oh he so, does yeah. okay big music guy so. yeah so yeah I've, I've got a few musicians on this thing i've got a very broad audience okay of, yeah of thing my only niche part is the fact that's in the southeast okay gotcha so but anyways i'm here with uh jillian fay of uh the charlotte hounds which is the local lacrosse team Yes, Major League Lacrosse. Major League Lacrosse. Now, 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 can you kind of tell me a little bit about uh, the MLL? Did I get that right? MLL. Did, did I, did I, did I it's actually, tricky. It's confusing. It's tricky because there, there's a there's a because I, I I work in, in professional wrestling and there's a Mexican promotion called CMLL. Okay. So yeah. I add I add an extra L to everything all the time. Yeah. Well, Major League Lacrosse is the professional outdoor lacrosse league. Okay. There's also a National Lacrosse League, which is played indoor. Um, box lacrosse okay. is kind of the nickname for that. So major league lacrosse, outdoor field lacrosse, similar to the college style game. Um, some of the rules are a little bit different in the professional ranks. We do have the shot clock and we have a two point line, mm -hmm. which they don't have in college. Um, though there has been a lot of talk about trying to get a shot clock in the college game to, to speed that up. So mm -hmm. It's um, still a pretty small league, eight teams right now, mostly on the East Coast. We do have a team in Denver, and they're hoping to expand back towards the West Coast again eventually. Um, at one point, there were t a couple teams in California, but they just didn't have a good business plan success rate, so those folded. Um, but yeah, Charlotte, Florida is the other Southern team, the Florida launch, and they relocated from Canada, actually. They were outside Toronto and then moved down to test out the Florida market. Okay. Well, now how long has the league been in existence? The league itself started in 2001. Okay. Um, so it's been around a while. The Hounds came to Charlotte in 2012. So we'll be going into our fourth year. Okay. Well, how did we get, become so lucky to get a, get a team? So basically, Jim McPhillamy, the president and managing partner of the Hounds, he was kind of... He had just left one job and was, wasn't was really sure what he wanted to do, um, things like that. And a friend of his son started playing lacrosse. They were like talking about it, got to talking about the league. Jim got in contact with David Gross, who's the commissioner, and was able to put together an investment group. 
okay. that that brought the team to town. So. Okay. Well, what are some of the, what are some of the challenges? We've we've got the the ground like What are some of the challenges of bringing? like a professional lacrosse team to Charlotte. Like, I mean, just, just, the, I mean, even something simple as the nuts and the bolts, like where are we going to play our games? How are we going to do that? Just to, to kind of take me through that process for what you know about it. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is where are we going to play? Who's going to be our sponsors? Where are we going to get the players from? Where are our ticket sales going to come from? So Jim was lucky enough to stumble upon Memorial stadium in uptown Charlotte and it's a county-owned venue, so the Hounds rent from the county to be able to play there, but it had been very underutilized in years prior. You know, there would be some Powerade State games there or a few high school football rivalry games and things like that, but there was never a consistent presence at Memorial Stadium. And yeah, it's, it's a wonderful venue, and anybody that knows the city of Charlotte, it, it's a pretty historic venue. I mean, they've, I they've, think 36, 1936, yes. I think it was it's built. It's been around for a yeah. very, very long time, and of course, they used to hold wrestling events there. and just Political all, rallies, yes. all kinds of things. Oh yeah, Billy Graham things, yeah. rallies, all kinds of just wonderful stuff, almost like it was the heart of the city, and especially the Park Center. I, I think that even predated the the old Coliseum on Independence a little bit too. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of the, the the big events what happened in that you know, the Park Center and that that arena right there. And it's a prime location. And if you are on the field, you look and get the most beautiful view of the Charlotte skyline too. Yeah, it, that's the thing. Right it's so between. centrally located, even with all the growth that's happened in Charlotte, it's still very centrally located. So finding a place to play that was that close to downtown was very important so that way people aren't you're not asking people to drive an hour to your games or 45 minutes to your games it's and still plenty of parking and everything is very yeah great spots to tailgate and all of that um so that and then getting some local sponsors on board and just making sure there was a big enough fan base that would support the team and get behind and buy the tickets and i think that's basically what every team struggles with the most is lacrosse is growing but it is still very much a niche sport Mm -hmm. So building the fan bases is always a struggle. But, you know, the participation of lacrosse in the Carolinas has doubled really? in the past few years. Oh, my gosh. There's so many. I can't remember the exact number, but so many high schools that added it as a varsity sport. And there's new club programs popping up. And actually, a lot of the Hounds players now run their own local club programs that a lot of these kids oh. are playing in and then coming out to our games. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, now that we're talking about the players, now how? Now we figured out already. We discussed how. How? Where are you going to play? Now right. the question is, how do we get players? How? How does that process happen when you're trying to start a new team? So, like I said, there's only eight teams in the league, and when the Hounds joined in 2012, the Ohio Machine also joined. So the league went from six to eight in 2012. So the first thing they did was an expansion draft and. Each team is allowed 25 active players and six practice squad players during the season. So it's not a lot of players, and there's a lot of lacrosse talent out there. So, you know, within the player pool, we did an expansion draft. Um, Teams were allowed to protect, I think, 19 or 20 players they were allowed to protect, and then all the others got put back in the player pool. And a lot of kids just coming out of college, entering the player pool. Um, so that was the first way that we kind of built the team. And then through trades, you know, the, um, the GM and the coach made a big draft day trade to get a couple of veteran players, um, over in Charlotte. So we had those guys because that's, what's hard as an expansion team too, is you don't want to get a bunch of these guys that have never played in the league before and have no idea what they're doing. You need someone to be able to step up as a leader. So that was kind of the thought process behind the big trade on our first day and make a splash and get everyone to know the name. Okay. And then of course they, they, they get relocated here and they start practicing and stuff like that. So, you know, what does the team provide for those players? Is there anything, I, like I said, I know it's, it's a very, you know, very small sport and stuff like that. And like I said, I do independent wrestling, so I know there's not a lot of money sometimes, (laughs) you know, I know it's it's not the NFL. Yeah. Far from. (laughs) So, Um, yeah. So it's actually a really interesting process because most of the major league lacrosse players are more than just lacrosse players. They'll work nine to five Monday through Friday jobs, hop at, at the airport on a plane on Friday, fly out to Charlotte, We'll do a Friday night practice, Saturday morning walkthrough, play the game on Saturday. They fly out Sunday morning. Oh, so some of them you don't even live locally, in right. a sense. Like they may like like somebody from 
A lot of guys in New York. Okay. Actually, a lot of um, New York City guys. Is, yeah, so they work their job in New York. They hop on a plane. They do their practice. So they're only really practicing once, once a, a week. week. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, and we have, I think, five or six guys locally to Charlotte. Um, and we kind of made that a big deal for us as well as an expansion team and a new team with not having the budget. You mm-hmm. don't want to be flying guys in from California every week. It's just not financially responsible. But so you're on the hook for, for flying them in. and, and Right. Yep. Location the location. team pays for the flights, pays for their hotels, and the majority of their food okay. while they're in town. Each player gets like a, a stipend a per diem, diem yeah. to spend when they're in town. So it does help when guys are local. And, you know, if they're in, I think we got one guy in Greenville. We had a couple in Charleston before. And, you know, that's the case. They'll drive up and they get paid by the mileage mm-hmm. um, for things like that. But it that definitely makes it harder in terms of building a team as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's very similar to, like I said, you know, independent wrestling. It's better to have less flights and pick from local talent as opposed to flying exactly. something from New York or Canada or wherever. So, and of course, you got to figure out how to put, put them up someplace. And then there's that whole that whole issue and stuff like that. So. Um, as far as the local players, what are some? You mentioned some of the things that they've started their own clubs here. What are some other things that you you get some of the local players to do to probably raise awareness about the team? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think definitely the club teams that they have are huge, and part of that too is a lot of the local tournaments. Um, some are hosted in Charlotte. Some are hosted, you know, a little bit northern of North Carolina, mm-hmm. South Carolina, kind of all over. And we'll try and get some of our players out to there. And we bring our merchandise tent and our ticket information and, and things like that. And then we have a junior hounds program, okay. which is done through the YMCA's in North Carolina. And we'll do clinics, introductory clinics to introduce kids to lacrosse for the first time. So we'll bring, you know, we have a bunch of donated equipment and we'll bring that out and just kind of show them how to throw and catch the ball and just introduce it and see if it's something that they're interested in learning more about. Um, Those are probably the biggest is right now it's still very much lacrosse oriented. Mm -hmm. Um, Every now and then, you know, we'll try and keep within the the news cycle and, you know, there's some 24 hour sports networks with Time Warner Cable and things like that. And we'll try and get the guys to pop in every now and then on there to keep keep the name out there other community events like um the festival in the park we were out at and had some of our players out there and just any other kind of community events like that okay. do you run any type of local tryouts or any you always looking for talent like how does that that process does that does that process happen actually we did do open tryouts in the past and we grabbed one or two players from that um they ended up being our practice squad guys but of course, there is a cost to even doing the open tryout yes. too, and there is so much talent in the player pool now that you're already you have a preseason roster of 40 guys that you already have to cut down to 25, 31 if you count practice squads. So, so really, there's a lot of there's a lot of talent out there because you think right. about like the places in New York that probably like every high school has their own talent, and then every college, and then right. of course when they graduate, a lot of them. They only have eight teams to really select exactly. from right now. So so really you can get the pick of the litter. You can get the best of the best. Exactly. Your, and sometimes teams will do like joint tryouts too. Um, last year we went up to Baltimore and did a joint tryout with, with the team in Annapolis. Okay. Well, that's super. Now, now as far as, you know, you've got, now we've got the players. Now we've got the place to play. Now how do we get uh, as far as like getting sponsors and how does that process happen? So our general manager, Wade Leapart, is also our sponsorship and marketing director. So he's out doing all the kind of calls for that and whatnot. Is it just cold calling pretty much from that? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he's been in the the business in Charlotte for a while, so he had a lot of good relationships built up already. And the president, Jim McPhillamy, had a background in Charlotte too, knew a lot of people. So some of the sponsors come down from the league level. Um, like the apparel sponsors and things like that. And then after that, really what we wanted to do was stay local with as many sponsors as possible, Um, just because it doesn't really make sense for us if a company out in Montana is offering tons of money, how is that really going to help our fans? We wanted to build the connection between the team and its sponsors so that you know Hawthorne's Pizza is the pizza of the hounds. Yeah, so you're you're looking for your local... Uh, local brands. You're not exactly. necessarily going. I mean, it'd be nice if Wells Fargo. We have a Coca-Cola okay. deal, so there is some of those, and 
we do do have stuff with Wells Fargo and Bank of America, but it just helps because they're located here. In exactly. Charlotte. I was gonna say that was a bad example because <laughs> right. they're located here. I was thinking of something like Papa John's. Yeah, but we also sense. have um, the Charlotte Metro Credit Union. Yeah. Much smaller level. We are lucky enough to have the Whitewater Center, so we do a really cool partnership with them. Ortho Carolina has been great to us on the medical side. So it's just really about building the connections because we know that lacrosse is a small sport and major league lacrosse is a small league and these sponsors aren't going to get as much out of working with us exposure wise as they would with the Panthers or the Hornets or things like that. So what we try and do in return is give them more brand loyalty and fan loyalty and really connect the fans to their brands. We'll do like Harris Teeter gift card giveaways during the games. And I mentioned Hawthorne's pizza. That's what we sell at our games and do our birthday parties and the Whitewater Center is doing our one of our VIP sections now, and they'll get um, passes and things like that. Yeah, because so. it's probably not fiscally responsible for them to be a sponsor of the Carolina Panthers. It probably costs a considerable amount more money, but at the same time, too, they're still getting their name out there in some way, in fa- fashion, especially with sports fans. So it, you're, yeah. they're getting a lot more for their money when they put it down, which is... And the Major League Lacrosse has become... A very we get a great kind of 21 to 35 tailgating crowd but we also get a ton of families Mm -hmm. and so i think that's what a lot of the sponsors look at is that family demographic you know harris teeter wants those families at their grocery stores Mm -hmm. so it it makes sense for them that way whereas panthers games you're you're kind of all over and it's a little bit more corporate already yeah exactly and 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 when you go out getting sponsors that's a difficult thing because there's always a parent company of this company right and there's so many hoops to get through you can exactly. never get directly to the person that owns a biz- business but with locally you can kind of do that and then they they feel like they're getting something out of it yeah and we'll have them they'll sponsor different events for us too um when we're out you know we'll be partnered with ortho carolina at a local 5k or something like that and that's one of the things we're really trying to do more of this year is trying to do more besides just game day things with them trying to do partner for other community events with our sponsors to to keep both names kind of out there in the community okay now no i'm not asking for specific numbers but i mostly want to know what that sponsorship money goes towards and for like is it get uniforms is doing for travel expenses is that really where that money's going toward the the day-to-day operations or what are some things that those that sponsor money does for the team basically exactly like you said it goes into the operations and the day-to-day running of the team um we're able you know to fly the players in put them up get them suited up in nice gear pay the salaries of the staff that's working to promote the team and, and things like that. I mean, you hear it in baseball all the time, you know, the higher payroll, you got to supplement it somehow. So mm-hmm. the more money we can bring in, the better players we can get and the better amenities we can offer the players so that they perform at their best. Yeah, and the be- better better team, and then you got a better team in Charlotte, so then you have to want to back it, so then you got like, hey, we're, we've got the best lacrosse team yeah. in, in the country. You really want to get behind this. You get better sponsors right. and better things. And, and then, then more fans and more ticket sales. And I'll, and I'll put, you know, steamrolls like exactly. that. Exactly. But you just brought up something about the office staff. Mm-hmm. So I think that's an expense that people probably don't think about, especially maybe right. even the sponsors themselves are realizing they have – there has to be the people behind the players. Right. Now, now obviously, we're, we're in the office right now, uh, and, and I was actually kind of blown away by the amount of people that were right. working in here. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was like, I'm very impressed. Yeah. I, I, I was expecting maybe you and two other people. <laughs> so, right. so not, not, you know, because you know, it seemed like it was very hard to get, get in touch with them. I'm like, oh, I, I guarantee she's probably <laughs> extremely busy with everything she has to worry right. about. She's probably running that entire office. But then I walk in, and there's quite a few people. And I'm like, wow. And then if she's yeah. busy, then all these other people got to be extremely busy as well. So yeah, let's just talk little, about the office staff. It's a little deceiving right now because – we have all taken on a new soccer team as well. I mentioned Jim McPhillamy, our president. He started another investment group to buy a USL soccer team in Charlotte, the Charlotte Independents. So part of the reason he was able to do that is because he now has two team budgets going into one front office staff. Okay. So everyone that had responsibilities for the Hounds now have those responsibilities for the Independents. Um, so, and with the Independents, we added a few more people um, you know, we needed a soccer general manager, a soccer operations director, because those are some of the, the nuances that they don't really cross over with lacrosse. I mean, for me, PR and marketing, whichever sport you're yeah. doing, it's very similar. But exactly. And then there's probably similar sponsors, so you could facilitate both of them in similar ways. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, we have 
And then we brought in another ticket sales guy. So we've got two guys on ticket sales, one on ticket operations. We've got our community relations coordinator. I said general manager, operations director, sponsorship sales, president, CFO. So we're, we're really growing now. And, it, and it's exciting to be able to to bring on these these extra people because it does alleviate a little bit of stress. Yeah, I bet because I mean I I work in an office as well and I'm you know also promoting events and scheduling events and and sometimes it almost feels like a full time job just sending out emails all day. Yeah. You know it feels like oh, I've got to send an email to this building. I have to send an email to this person. I have to see what this person schedules yeah. like. I have to check on this shipment. You know well what are some of the day to day operations that, that that you do as the as the as the marketing director. I guess? I will say it is nice in the months from about October to December when it's much quieter because yes. it's the off season for both teams. So that's kind of when we all get our summer vacations. If you that's will. where it's like slow. That's that's <laughs> right. we're playing Minesweeper for for a yeah. few hours. So now you know, now that we're getting so close to the start of the season, it's kind of you know keeping in touch with the media members, letting them know that the season's upcoming. We nailed down our training camp days, so we're going to be doing a media day to coincide with that, to get the media out, meet the new players, things like that. Um, myself also, besides you know media interaction, I'm doing features for the website um, on the players or the drafts that we've recently had, um, things like that to keep fresh content up there. You know, managing social media, keeping the Facebook, the Twitters, the Instagrams, which the now LinkedIn's. almost comes like a part-time job. Another, yeah, that's another. Got to black out a full two hours or so there. It's when I put a new story up on the website, it's like you got to go through that checklist. Like, okay, got it on the website. I got it on Facebook, which went to Twitter. I should probably Instagram an image of it too. Oh, and then LinkedIn. You and, know? and then you, and then you <laughs> want to put it up during like uh, prime peak hour, hours. peak yeah. hours, which, which, which uh, I know for wrestling, the peak hours and peak days are Mondays and Fridays. What would be the peak hours for probably someone like you and which you, it's usually what we try and do is either first thing in the morning. So between the eight thirty and nine, cause it's one of the first things people do when they come in is especially if you're doing email marketing, mm-hmm. you know, first thing you do, you sit in the office and check your inbox. Um, and the same thing, you open up your Twitter and you see what's fresh there, your Facebook. People usually check it first thing in the morning, lunchtime, right before they leave the office or on the commute home for those mm-hmm. that walk or take public transportation and then right before bed yeah. or kind of the other hours. We haven't noticed too much in terms of days of the week um, mm-hmm. that it fluctuates, but definitely we've done some test times with, with sending out the emails and it seems like that 4.45 or kind of 9 p.m., seem to be our sweet spots a little bit in terms of that yeah and that's the funny. thing with social media is it like especially those peak hours like in the unless you have like like the scheduled tweets thing right. set up you're like oh crap i gotta stop what yeah. i'm doing right now because i have to make sure i get this tweet out before 8, yeah. 8, 8 p.m and then make sure this happens and stuff like right that. or you put it on twitter but forgot to put it on facebook and you're just yeah like, oh. or, or or like you you make a misspelling and you cut it on facebook and you can correct <laughs> it there but you can't correct exactly. it on twitter and you're like oh yeah yeah um, but other than the social media, you know, it's kind of building up the publications, the record book for the hounds, which goes back our stats for the three years that we've been in town, um, building the media guide, the game notes, um, and those kind of publications. Okay. And, and who are some, what are some other like job titles some of these other people have in the office and like maybe some of their day to day things that we may not think about, you know, like, like you say the ticket salesperson, like, you know, he's got to, I mean, obviously it's like, okay, set up the tickets, but what are, what are some, you know, typical duties that we may not think about that probably more difficult than what we think. Right. So for the ticket sales, you know, it's trying to get everyone that has been a season ticket holder to renew. That's Mm -hmm. the first thing you want to do is engage your season ticket holders and make sure they know how much they're appreciated. Um, After that, the next big thing for us is group sales. So we'll have some of our ticket staff will go out and meet with program directors of local organizations or local teams and let them know about, hey, these are the discounts we offer. If, you know, there's a tournament coming this weekend, we want your team to come to our game after they finish the tournament. Um, So group sales are definitely a big one. And then we have our community relations staff. Um, We have Christy Boyles and Brittany Phillip, and their job is to kind of manage, like I mentioned, the Junior Hounds program or when we're at Festival in the Park or out at the 5Ks. Um, They're the ones, too, that are kind of organizing what players are going to be where and who staffed this event, who staffed that event. Um, And that's a lot more time-consuming, I think, than people realize because most of those events are non-business hours. They're the all-day Saturdays or the all-day Sundays, and 
things like that. So it's definitely some, some extra hours that go into that and ticket operations. Um, you know, people, you get a ticket with a seat number and that's all you see, but you don't see everything in the background of building out each individual seat in a manifest and printing the tickets and processing the payments and, and all of that. People don't really think about the person on the back end of that too much. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and you know, I've run a lot of conventions with larger wrestling events and I know that's quite a difficult thing and then you have to deal with like the fire codes and the way the building yeah. wants it set up but then you think about how the way you want it right. set up and then that's that's always where yeah colliding and then heads happen when the internet goes out on game day and yeah know, and you got all these pre-sale exactly. locations you didn't have print off and so. then yeah I, I completely yeah and then we that. talked a lot about you know the sponsorship side of things and not only the selling of the sponsorships but the activation too so that's a big part and Another big part is just networking, you know, everybody on their own kind of going out to different events in the community and meeting different business people. And, you know, you're kind of always selling the business, whether it's someone who's going to be a new fan, a new sponsor, anything. Okay. So now we've got, we've got the location. We're going to play the games. We've got the players. We've got the office staff, the right. backbone of the whole operation. Yes. Now launch the first debut season. How, how was the response to the debut season? Happy, mixed, or about what you were thinking? Really happy. Um, I think we averaged the first year around, I guess over the past three, I can't remember exactly, but we averaged around 5,000 fans per game, which puts us right in the middle of the pack for the league. Um, Boston has traditionally drawn really well, and Chesapeake, the team in Annapolis, has drawn really well in the one in Denver. And we were right there in that fourth spot. So we outsold some of the teams that had been in the league for many years longer. So that was really exciting for us from that standpoint. And just the season ticket base was up there in the league, too. I think we were third or fourth in terms of season ticket holders, which was really exciting. We did awesome with sponsorships. And a lot of those sponsors have renewed now going into the fourth year. They're still with us. And... Then the team didn't do as well as we would have liked. I think we finished six in our first year, five and nine, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. But just to see the fans keep coming out week in and week out and cheering us on and all the conversations on social media and the interaction like that, it was, it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And then we also had really good media coverage the first year, too. We have a great relationship with the Charlotte Observer, and they have um, almost a dedicated beat writer that we get, you know, he has oh, other assignments, yeah. but we always had the same guy coming out to do our games and the same with a lot of the local TV stations. They always made an effort to be out and get some highlights or at least mention the scores and, and things like that. So I think that was really exciting too. Yeah. And, and you speak of media and, and one of the ways that I, well, one of the way I discovered the team okay. was, uh, I, I live just over by Independence Arena, like back up one of the neighborhoods, and I ride my bike regularly in the okay. summer. And I happen to be riding by, because I always ride by Independence, like Arena. Well, I mean the 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 place where you guys play. I don't know why that's Memorial. Like, <laughs> Memorial. I get Independence and Memorial confused because <laughs> they're all right there. But the Memorial Stadium, and I saw something going on. I'm like, what's going on? And I just I didn't pay no attention to it. And I and I usually ride my bike, and you know, I sit at a bar for a bit and just kind of enjoy the day. And I just happened to notice. Memorial Stadium being on TV, I'm like, what? why is this on? Because I like, recognize it because right. I've seen it on TV before and, and different things. And, and I was like, it's it like a cross. Is that what was going on? Like, and, and I I didn't really realize it, but it was on ESPN. Mm -hmm. So so can you talk about like the TV coverage of of the the league? Yeah, usually the league office. Um, we have the main league partners in ESPN and CBS Sports Network is a new one that came on. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, but they've been awesome too. Their production is out of this world. It's funny because normally I'm at the games live, so I don't get to see it a lot. No. But when we do have an away game or the other teams are playing on CBS Sports Network, you're just like, wow, they've done an awesome job with that. So the league sets that schedule with them. Last year we did, we tried to deal with YouTube mm -hmm. and we did some games that way. Um, it went okay. There were obviously you know, some buffering. Oh, there's a, don't even, get me, start, don't even get me started on streaming. That's, yeah. a, that's another thing that I deal with all the time is live, live streaming events. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I really, if we could just connect this entire country with right. fiber optics, yeah. it would be far better. Google Fiber. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah. So there, there were definitely some issues with that. And now we've moved back to um, being on the ESPN3 platform, mm -hmm. which has been really exciting. 
And I think that's the biggest thing is trying in order to grow the sport exactly like you said is growing the TV exposure because you want those people that are home on a Saturday night flipping through the channels. You know, they see some sport on, you know, yeah. everyone just kind of has sports on in the background. They see they're like, oh, what's this? Whoa, that's it's here in Charlotte. Fast. Why don't I? Whoa, why don't that's I go? Goals. That's, yeah. Oh, I could have been there. That's here. Exactly. So I think that's important. Some teams in the league have local TV deals as well. Um, so we don't have one right now, but we did in the past. So we're working on hopefully doing that again because that's the biggest thing is you want as many games as possible on TV. I mean, you want the fans in the stands, but if they're not going to be there, you still want them watching. Yeah, absolutely. And and I always say any any new venture that I get into, especially if it's entertainment or media in that sense, I, I always t- talk about like that first couple years is just letting people know you exist. So I, I feel like the, the TV things is, is a big part of that. And also, what are some other things that you do like media wise, like maybe like, you know, like I said, you, you mentioned the YouTube, you also mentioned, you know, ESPN. What are some other things electronically you're doing to let people know you exist? I think it's just kind of little things. It is so much social media marketing these days. So it's, you know, whether you're shooting a corny five minute video with a player that then you send out that way. Um, that's been a, a good one because that's the biggest thing, too, is you want to build a connection between the fans and the players so that they're rooting for guys, not just for a team. You want them to know who's out there and who's wearing the numbers and what those guys are kind of like off the field as well. Um, so it really has become very social media driven. Um, it just seems to be that's where the fans are. Yeah. And absolutely. when the players, you know, like we mentioned, are kind of spurs all across the East Coast, the easiest way to get everyone together is kind of online. And I know one of the other things a lot of our players have done um, recently is Google Hangouts. Okay. So there's Inside Lacrosse Magazine is the biggest and most well-known publication that covers the sport. And so they started doing kind of an online series where they would get some of the MLL players and do a Google Hangout. And what's cool about that is you can get, like we have a lot of Loyola lacrosse players on our team, Loyola alum. And they would do both two Loyola players, whereas one stationed living in New York, the other's living in Baltimore, but they can get them both up on the screen Mm -hmm. in this hangout and do kind of a joint interview that way, which has been kind of cool. So, and Skype too has kind of played into doing that as well. And then the league does a um, show called Inside the MLL, and it typically only runs during the season, but they'll do a lot of their interviews that way too via Skype or you know, FaceTime just because the players don't all live where the studio is in Boston. Yeah. So yeah, that's technology has definitely helped connect the, the fans and the players. Okay. Um, and like I said, I'm maybe not interested so much in the particular numbers, but it, you know, a lot of, you know, leagues have particular TV deals and stuff like that. And I don't know if there's a way, if they made a deal with a specific league and then that trickles down to you, or is it just with the league and then that money just kind of sits with the league and then the promotion of the league? You know how that TV works with you guys? Yeah, there's a little bit of revenue sharing kind of that goes into it. The majority is the league itself, but yeah, there is a little bit of trickle down in terms of revenue sharing. Okay, so the more that you're on TV, the more you'd probably Right, and it's the same with um, the league-wide sponsorship and marketing deals. You know, the league sees the most of that, but then there's a revenue sharing that goes down to the teams with Warrior and New Balance and and things like that and they actually just open to help the players because another way that these players supplement their incomes because major league lacrosse doesn't pay a lot right now um is they opened up the equipment so that guys could be sponsored by these different equipment dealers and before when they had those sponsorships they weren't able to use that equipment in the games because it wasn't a league sponsor Mm -hmm. well now these other suppliers can buy in and now they're sponsored players can use the sponsored gear in the game so Mm -hmm. that really opened up a lot of opportunities for guys that way not and that's not on a team level that's just on a strict individual player Yeah, much like nba players and shoe contracts right exactly yeah so if you know ryan flanagan has an stx deal the team Mm -hmm. doesn't see anything of that but it benefits him and he's able to supplement his playing career a little bit better by getting that equipment and and yeah, then he can it. focus more on playing lacrosse and be better for the team. And exactly. Then more so, it's, it's all trickle. So that's been a, a good, innovative way that the league has definitely grown in terms of marketing and sponsorship over the past year. Okay. So now we've had the first season, now the second season. Now, now was there a little bit of a growth in a sense? 
Yeah, so we actually went, I think I said, five and nine the first year. Mm -hmm. 2013, we made it all the way to the MLL championship game. Oh, wow, just a quick turnaround. What, what, yeah, what, 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 so what was the thing with that? It was funny then? because we went seven and seven, like just snuck into that last spot as mm -hmm. the four seed. And in the semifinals, our seven and seven squad had to play the 14 and 0 Denver mm -hmm. Outlaws. And it was the biggest upset of lacrosse when well, we won. Obviously, yeah. And I think it was a three or four goal win that we had. So that was a really, really exciting um, game to be a part of. And it was funny because, you know, I was up in the press box, of course, doing the play-by-play -play and writing the post-game story for the mm -hmm. semifinal. And I left a little bit early to go down on the field so I could grab the guys for their interviews and whatnot. And I tried to sneak out first and get in the elevator, but the Denver PR guy caught me in the elevator too, and so I was a little bit of an awkward ride down. <laughs> I bet, I bet. <laughs> he was congratulating, and I was like, well, there's still a few minutes left. He's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, So that was a really exciting year, and I think that really helped to put us on the map, and a lot of people in Charlotte saw that and were like, oh, wow. Um, last year we had a little bit of a fall fallback, though, mm -hmm. um, four and 10. So definitely not our best year. And the biggest thing that we've talked about, you know, is how the players don't live here. They don't get to travel every week. And so one of the hardest things for teams is trying to build chemistry. And we had a lot of young guys come in last year. Mm -hmm. So they didn't really know the speed of the league, the style of the league, the style of the other guys and things like that. So it was just we hate that people try and say that we're doing a rebuilding because we did trade away this offseason a lot of veteran players, and it's not so much a rebuilding as this is only just our fourth year. We're still building our core and still building our identity. So I think we're in much better shape going into this year. You know, Now we have those kind of 10 core guys that have two seasons together under their belt that will really blossom going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, we just mentioned playoffs and how the playoffs work. You said like it's a four-team playoff and then, you know, probably the number one seed hosts their own, you know, and then is there a neutral site for the championship game? Or yeah, so they actually just changed. Last year was the first year they altered the playoff format. So two years ago when the Hounds were in it, the way it worked was it was championship weekend. So on Saturday, two semifinal games were played. There was the morning, I think 2 p.m., and that was the four seed versus the one seed. And then right after that, at 4.35 p.m. was three seed versus two seed. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday afternoon was the championship game mm -hmm. with the two winners. So these guys were playing back-to-back -back yeah. regardless, which is obviously a very exhausting Exhausting, weekend. but it's almost like with a league such like this, it's financially better as opposed to have, holding two events and paying yeah. rent on two was, different buildings. And it helped to sell tickets because you're selling tickets for a weekend event exactly. as opposed to just a final. And so that was always at a neutral site. Um Last year, they instituted the um, higher seed host format. So now we have the first weekend of August is the semifinal games. It, it's still two. You know, the early game is still the 4-1. Late game is still the 3-2. Mm -hmm. And then the following week, I think it'll be August 8th this year, will be the championship game. So the championship will be neutral site, and the two semifinals are hosted by the higher seed. Oh, okay. And they saw a really good success rate with that last year, and just in terms of the home team fans really buying in and, mm -hmm. and getting behind. Okay. Well, that, that's an interesting format, but I, I do see the, the, the advantage of selling an entire weekend and an experience in, in a sense, and that's something if you wanted to sell to a city, you know, like, hey, do you want to come in and, and host this and stuff like that? I see that being very attractive. But also, too, speaking of playoffs, I just noticed over here the there's an actual all-star game for the league. And yes. you hosted it. So. Yeah. Um, and it actually worked out really well that the year we hosted it was the same year we went to the championships, though. It was okay. an exciting one. But basically, um, cities will bid to mm -hmm. host if, if they're interested and – we just thought that would be a great way to really put the team on the map in Charlotte and in North Carolina is if we could bring this event to town. And they've done a bunch of different formats for the All-Star Game over the year. They've done kind of a young guns versus old guys. where They have the rookies versus the veterans. And we also have um, Team USA, the national team, versus the MLL All-Stars. Then we did the year that it was here in Charlotte, they did – to honorary captains, there was a contest to become a captain of the team, and then they did, those captains did playground style, yeah. where 
they just went back and forth with all these guys lined up. And, you know, they had a coach by the side to make sure they got, you know, four defenders, four mm-hmm. attackmen, things like that. Um, so it's always a fun event. And then they always do a skills competition with it in halftime, you know, fastest shot. Um, then they do like a creative, like a freestyle shot, accuracy. So it's it's just it's fun for the fans. And they always do um, a youth tournament with it autograph signings things like that and then it's always partnered with the charity and then a portion of the ticket sales and they'll do they'll bid off the autograph jerseys and all that goes to the um whatever charity that we've partnered with okay well, super so so are there any other uh like events we can see you and when does the all-star game come up in the season is it after the season mid-season mid-season or? so mid-season. this year they actually moved the lacrosse season up two weeks major league lacrosse so it usually would start the last week of April. And what we found was as the season trickled further into the summer, we lost some families and some group sales because of travel teams and tournaments and family vacations mm-hmm. and things like that. So now we've moved up the season to April 12th. Okay. Um, so we're hoping to alleviate some of you know those weekends that people have to miss. So All-Star now I think will fall mid-June, I think June 13th this year um and i mentioned the semifinals and finals that first weekend in august so um it'll be interesting to see how everyone responds to the new schedule we've also tried to do move away from the saturday night games into the sunday afternoon games um you know we had some families express interest in that because the kids are younger and they want Mm -hmm. to bring them out but you know they can't be up till 10 p.m out at a game and it also helps because a lot of major league lacrosse players are college coaches. Uh, and the college lacrosse season trickles down to Memorial Weekend. Mm-hmm. So college games are typically, you know, Saturday afternoons. So we would lose a lot of players to that. So the league decided to try these Sunday games so that way our coaches can still make their commitments, then get a quick flight down and play our game. Mm-hmm. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see what the response is. Yeah, because I mean, Sunday afternoon is a tricky thing, especially in the South with church and everything right. else. So there's there's there is that concern. But I have seen quite a few successful uh, promotions and and games and stuff played on Sundays. So it seems like about two o'clock on, you're kind of safe, right? You know? <laughs> and maybe if you want to put it to four, sometimes too is you know later on. But anything when you get to six to eight, you know, people start worrying about work and stuff like that. So. Yeah, so we've tried some different ones, and I think we have a. Um a couple of Friday night ones this year, and I think we might even have like a three o'clock Saturday or a five o'clock Saturday too. So okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the upcoming season. What are some things planned? You know, what's the outlook for that right now? Yeah, so we're actually we'll open April twelfth, which is a Sunday. I believe it's a one o'clock game, um, and I think the biggest thing is like we talked about the chemistry of the team this year. I think the team is much more well balanced than it was last year. And one of the other things we like to do, like I mentioned to you, we have a lot of Loyola players. We also have a lot of Duke players and UNC players. Okay. So we really try and draw on the local talent at the collegiate level so that way people who have a connection to those colleges or those college players will now transfer that connection to following the Hounds as mm-hmm. well. Um, but, yeah, we usually get a great tailgate crowd before the games. The parking lots are filled about two hours before face-off. Um, We'll get a kids zone out there that the kids can play in with um, where they can do some shooting and some bounce house kind of things. And um, we usually the halftime kind of varies. Um, we'll get some youth like youth games during halftime or things like that. And then after the games, the players always stay and sign autographs for all the fans and kids. And so the games are a lot of fun. OK. Uh, kind of wrapping up here. Is there anything else uh, that I, I, I missed or uh, on uh, or glazed over or anything you want to express more about the team in the upcoming season most specifically? I think the biggest thing is just getting people out to enjoy that first game because I didn't know anything about Major League Lacrosse until I was in grad school and I went to grad school in Boston which is where the league is based so I got an email through school about internships so I started as an intern for the league and didn't know anything about the game like whatsoever and then I saw my first one and I'm like wow, that was awesome. And you just become hooked. So I think it's just people just have to give it a chance. And I mean, the tickets are so affordable. You know, if you do a walk-up ticket, you're going to pay twelve fifty plus tax for one person to go. So 
it's very family friendly, family affordable, and just a fun way to spend an afternoon in the spring and summer to be outside, catch some action, and mm -hmm. just give it a chance would be the biggest thing that I have to say. Okay. Well, I th thank you for your time. This was wonderful. I got, got a good backstory, everything like that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited for the season to come up. I, I think it, where this will probably come out will be right before the season. So Perfect. anybody listening, you know, the season should be a couple weeks away. So make sure you get your tickets, you know, and, and, and come out and check out the Charlotte Hounds. So yeah, you, no one's ever left a game saying they had a bad time. So well, there you go. That's that, that that's the tagline right there. Charlotte Hounds. Nobody's ever said exactly. they walk away, you know. So. No one walks away angry. No one walks away angry. Charlotte Hounds. There's a new ad campaign. Perfect. There's a new ad campaign. I'm going to go start working on it right now. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for uh, for giving us all this information. Yeah. Thanks for expressing interest in the Hounds. Yeah. We'll look forward to having you at a game. Uh, I'll probably ride my bike down there. Perfect. <laughs>